I'm very excited to be here today. Um, one of the reasons why I love talking to groups of people about Little Falls history or Morrison County history is because I could talk about it all day, every day to anybody I meet, but you're a captive audience, so <laughs> you don't have a choice. No, I, I, I know you do have a choice, actually, to be here, and I thank you for coming. Um, my name is Gabrielle Meyer. I grew up in Little Falls. My maiden name is Van Rissingham, so I don't know if you know any of the Van Rissinghams in Little Falls. Um, a lot of people ask me, um, especially in the Piers area, if I'm related to any Myers and Piers, and the answer is kind of. I don't really know. That's actually the answer. Um, my father-in-law is Dr. Virgil Meyer in Little Falls, and he has a couple of cousins, I think, who live out in this area. So. Um, one of the reasons that I talk about Morrison County history is because, let me try to, maybe I can, there we go. Um, I am the sixth generation of my family to live in Morrison County, so that's pretty unique. Um, my earliest ancestor that I can find came to Morrison County in 1863, so that's actually quite a, a ways after Little Falls was started. As you can see, Little Falls was established in 1848. It makes us one of the oldest towns in the state of Minnesota. One of the reasons why there was so much interest in this area early on is because the falls on the river are only one of four natural waterfalls on the entire length of the Mississippi River. So they obviously wanted to come and utilize the power that those falls would create. So in 1848, um, that's what they did. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But I'm going to back up even a little bit further for you. We'll talk about the early, early history of this area. First, the Dakota, and, or known as Sioux, the Indians were here. And they were here for several um, centuries before the Chippewa or the Ojibwe came in up around the Great Lakes. And as the Chippewa moved down and pushed the Sioux out, there was lots and lots of fighting, and they were mortal enemies for centuries. Um, and then eventually, um, what is now Morrison County became what they called the contested zone. So anything south of Morrison County was the Dakota Sioux area, and anything north of there was the Chippewa Ojibwe. So because this area was so contested, there was a lot of bloodshed that took place here. And so what the United States government decided to do is they decided to send in a group of peaceful Indians, and they sent in the Winnebago. And the Winnebago actually settled closer to the Long Prairie area, but that did not work, that did not create any more peace in the area. And so uh, they decided to establish Fort Ripley. It was actually called Fort Gaines um, first, and then eventually it was Fort Ripley. So in 1848, when the government decided to build Fort Ripley, they needed lumber, and um, that was why James Green came in. He was the first settler in this area, and he built the sawmill on the, the falls. He put a wing dam and then um, built that sawmill. So he was the one that produced the lumber to build Fort Ripley. I'm going to kind of get ahead of myself a little bit here. Um, around that same time, the missionaries started coming into this area uh, because the, what a lot of people don't know is that there was actually a lot of activity in this area starting in the mid-1600s. And the reason for that is the fur trade. The uh, Hudson Bay, that's a whole, different, a whole different history, but the Hudson Bay Company first came in and they were trapping in this area. And then after that, the Northwest Company came in and they were trapping in this area. And so there were um, a lot of fur trade activity, especially on the Mississippi because it was a natural waterway to get their furs transported. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Grand Portage up in north of Duluth. Um, fascinating if you ever get a chance to go up there. They do a big rendezvous in August. I think it's the second weekend in August. You will learn things about Minnesota history that you had no idea because there was so much activity that was taking place here. 
So the missionaries came in um, around 1849 to the Belle Prairie area. And there were actually two different missionary groups. There was a Protestant missionary um, and there was a Catholic missionary. They were within shouting distance, but when you look at um, any documentation, they rarely mentioned each other. There was not a lot of work going on between them. Um, but the, the missionary that I'm most familiar with is the heirs, um, Elizabeth and, um, was it Frederick or Lyman? I can't remember, one was the father, one was the son. Frederick? Okay. Um, Frederick and Elizabeth started the Bell Prairie Mission, and they did it for the Ojibwe children and also the fur traders' children. And they had what they called a working farm where they would actually, um, the children would come there and they would learn how to work, and then they would also be educated. And one of my favorite stories about the, um, the missionary there is Elizabeth. Um, she graduated from Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts and she went back to Mount Holyoke to try to find more teachers to come out to her mission and um, while she was gone um, there was a man who came down the Mississippi he was a uh, missionary from the Red Lake area and he had been told that he needed to find a bride and marry her or else he needed to leave the mission field that was one of their qualifications. So he decided, he heard that there was one woman, a single woman, working at the mission. So he gets in the canoe without any prior notice. He comes down and he is going to propose to her and take her back with him. So what he didn't realize is that Elizabeth had just returned from out east with three more women. They were all single and they were all eager to get married. And so what happened then was a week of romance that one of the ladies talked about. Her name was Harriet uh, Fletcher. It was Harriet Nichols. She eventually married Fletcher, for which Fletcher Creek was named after. And she, she wrote a letter back to her brother, and she said there was more romance acted out here in one week than could fill a novel. And when I read that, I first came across it in this book. This is called Bring Warm Clothes. It was put together by Peg Meyer, who used to write for, I believe, the, min, or the, yeah, the Star Tribune, the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Um, I saw it in here first, and then I went down to the Minnesota Historical Society, and I actually was able to take a box out that belonged to Harriet Fletcher, and all of her family letters were in there, and I was able to read them. It was fascinating. Um, but yes, so the missionary ended up marrying the woman that he originally came for, the first one that was there. But he had everybody on pins and needles that week. So, <laughs> I love that story because it's true. Um, so, one of the things that uh, Christine talked about is that I write uh, fictional historical stories. And the story I just told you about the uh, missionaries, I actually turned into a novella that was my very first published story, actually. This came out in 2015, and it's in this collection with eight other authors who, are also, who also wrote stories. Um, it's called The Most Eligible Bachelor Collection, and the reason why it's called that is because our bachelor was very eligible. And, uh, but, so I changed names and I changed a few little facts, but pretty much the, the heart of the story is in this one right here. So, we have the missionaries, we have the military going on, and then that leads us to the establishment of Little Falls. So Little Falls, this is just a brief timeline and I'll go through this um, a little bit more detail. Basically, the settlement boom years was 1848 to 1857. There wasn't much here except for a sawmill and a couple of homes. And then um, in about 1855, 1856, it boomed. Little Falls grew very quickly. I'll talk about that. And then we had some recession, and we have the Little Falls War, and then the Gold Rush Widows, um, the U.S. Dakota War, Quiet Years, Boom Years, and then Limburg Fame. So that's, that's what I'll be talking about. This picture right here down at the bottom, it might be hard to see, was actually taken from the current courthouse 
in the 1870s. Um, on this corner over here is about where Pete and Joy's Bakery is. This building right here is where the shoe shop is. And this building is still currently here. What you can't really see is that there was a big ravine in Little Falls, and this is a bridge right there. So here were some of the key settlers of Little Falls. James Green, who was the first one here, he died a year after he built that sawmill. Um, he died of cholera when he was actually away from home. His wife sold the property to William Sturgis, and William Sturgis um, was here for a few years with his first wife, Lydia. Um, Lydia Kidder, um, her parents then also came to Little Falls, and so they were neighbors. They were the only people here at that time. Lydia passed away, and William buried her within sight of his home, and then he went back to Iowa, where he was from, and he got a new bride. Her name was Rosanna, and she was 19 years old, and when she moved to Little Falls, the only people in town were her husband's previous wife's parents, and then this grave that she could see from her front window. So that was it, and she had a couple of little kids, um, her stepchildren that she took care of, and so that was how things kind of progressed for a couple of years. And then around 1855, James Fergus on the end there, he and his wife, Pamelia, were coming up, uh, or they came up from Moline, Illinois, and James stopped in Minneapolis at St. Anthony Falls, where you know Minneapolis started, and he felt that he was already too late. He was too late to do anything in the Minneapolis area. He met Calvin Tuttle, who had a very successful sawmill in that area, and he asked him, do you know of any other place in, this, in Minnesota, or the, it was the territory at the time, that would be a good place for me to invest, build a sawmill. And so they actually took a little trip around the state. And um, Fergus Falls, if you're familiar with, he also started Fergus Falls. But they came to Little Falls and they met William Sturgis and they saw the potential of the water power and they saw the land and they felt that it was the best place in Minnesota to start a town. They thought that it would eventually rival anything going on at St. Anthony Falls. Eventually it would be as big as Chicago. They had big, big dreams. So they built a bigger sawmill and a bigger dam. They started the Little Falls Company. Um, down here on the bottom, on the corner, this is where um, it's right in the corner of downtown Little Falls where the antique shop is. This is no longer there, but this was called the Northern Hotel. And it was built by um, Nathan Richardson, who became eventually our first mayor in town. And he held more political offices than anybody else in Morrison County. And this is an early street scene looking north on Main Street in Little Falls. And an early scene of, of the uh, waterfalls not as early as 1855, 1856, but this is the earliest picture I could find. So they built a bigger dam. Um, they had plans to build a bridge across the river, all of these things. They laid out the town. They brought in like 60 workers. They cleared plots. They, they worked very hard, and within a year, they had about 300 people living in town. Um, if you're familiar at all with the Gold Rush Widows of Little Falls, this is a book that was published in the uh, 1980s, and it was actually put together by Linda Peavy and Ursula Smith. They were two ladies who lived in Montana, and they actually came across some letters that were written between James Fergus and his wife, Pamelia. Because what happened was, around 1855, um, 1856, there was a, a big recession, and um, there was also a huge storm that had come through, and had pushed out about $40,000 worth of logs. And the Little Falls Company was going bankrupt. And um, so they actually recouped once, and they, they sold, uh, I believe it was 40,000 shares, and they had a lot of money to put into the town, and that was going well for a while. But then um, with the recession, we had grasshopper plague for two years, and then we also had, um, what they called a gang of desperados who came into Little Falls 
And they actually, there was a few members from Little Falls, one being Nathan Richardson's brother, um, who actually were gambling, they were looting, um, they went into a store on a Saturday night, they took everything out of the store, they broke the windows, they threw stuff out into the river, um, completely destroyed the store, and because it was Sunday the next day, it was a day of rest, so nobody went in to clean it up. Well, then the looters just went back the next day and um, did more damage. The other thing that happened at this time that was very difficult, um, there was a German pack peddler who used to come through the area, and actually I've seen some reports about him in other books I've read, not just this one. Um, and he was actually murdered, and his body was buried out on Long Prairie, and a woman came forward and she said that she knew who had done the, the murder. And so they brought three Native American men. They didn't really give them a chance to defend themselves. Jonathan Pugh, who was our sheriff at the time, he was corrupt. He was actually one of the gang members. He couldn't keep any peace and order in town. So he said, you know what, I'll just bring these Indians with me down to St. Paul and we'll have them take care of it. Well, there's a group of people in the Little Falls area who said that that wasn't good enough. And it was led by a man named Anson Northrup. And he started a lynch mob. They met about where the golf course is in Little Falls on Hilton Road. There was a big tree right there. They actually took those men and they hung them. And so um, after the, the men died, a couple of ladies, some of their, their family came in, and I guess they mourned so loudly that they could hear it all the way downtown. It was that devastating. So they buried those um, bodies right there. The Little Falls um, area actually tried to get a vigilance committee together to take care of this, all of these problems that were going on. They actually petitioned the state legislature, or it was actually territory legislature at the time, to remove their sheriff because he was so corrupt and the legislature did nothing. So they started what they called the Little Falls War and they basically, they declared war on the Desperados. There was a shooting in downtown, um, actually a couple of them. So basically the story goes with that is there was a justice of the peace, Reed Barnum, and he was an older man who lived in a very small house um, over by where the current courthouse is. And he was the only one trying to keep any law and order because he was the only one that had any kind of um, uh, authority. And so that group of men, the Desperados, they actually went to his home, tore the wall off of his shanty, pulled him out and beat him, leaving him for dead. He was able to crawl across the bridge over the ravine and get to the, um, the northern hotel, that white hotel I showed you. They found him again, beat him up again. And so at that point, um, there was a man who was the leader of the group and he shot into the hotel, of, uh, the northern hotel because there was a ball going on. There were, it's, it's like a, a novel, which I actually wrote about actually right here. <laughs> in this book. Um, so there was some um, Indian agents coming through the area and they had the Indian annuity money with them and this group was going to actually try to rob them but the Indian agents stopped at the hotel because of this ball. That made the group of desperados very angry so that was why they shot into the hotel. The um, the bullet went just a few inches above one of the agent's heads and that was when they were, they were tired of it. The town was tired of it so they got their guns and they went out in the streets of Little Falls and um, the only shooting that I know of is the doctor, his name was Dr. Joe Dan, um, he lived right downtown by the ravine. He was walking through the ravine and he found one of the men from this gang, he shot him just above the kidney and he took him home and he nursed him back to health because he was a doctor. And um, eventually the, the gang went west of town um, for two weeks. They tried pursuing him. And eventually Little Falls said, as long as you leave and never come back, we will consider everything forgiven because nobody died. The justice survived. 
And so that was the Little Falls War. Um, one of the gang leaders ended up being um, lynched out west. That was how his story ended. And another one became a hero in the Civil War. So, so this is all going on at this time in Little Falls. Um, and because, of, oh, and then also the Civil War breaks out. And because of all of this, um, um, James Fergus decided to lead a group of men out west to pursue gold. He thought that if they could get enough gold to bring back to Little Falls, that they could salvage this town. This is a picture of um, Nathan Richardson, the first mayor. He's sitting over here. And it's the city council at the time. And these are actually the bones that they dug up of the men that they, the Indians that they lynched out by the golf course. And apparently they left those bones at the courthouse for several years for people to come and see. I have no idea where they are now. So we get to 1860s and the Gold Rush Widows of Little Falls, which is what this book was um, created for or because of. Um, so James Fergus gets a group of men and they go out west. They go to Montana to the gold fields and they left all of their wives home with all of the children, all of the debt, all of the, the issues that they weren't dealing with, the women started to deal with. And so Pamelia um, and James, they kind of became the leaders of this group. And they were writing letters back and forth. And there was very few other letters that were going back and forth between the husbands and wives. So the letters that Pamelia wrote from Little Falls actually share a lot of information from other people to send to her husband to convey to their husbands and vice versa. So what happened is you get this book that is just chock full of amazing details about life in central Minnesota at that time. Um, this book is fabulous. If you ever get a chance to read it, I highly recommend it. Um, they sell it out at the Warehouser Museum. And mine, I have a couple of copies and it's, it's, it's all marked up and um, yeah. So this is a great book. Chief Hole in the Day, this is the second. Um, he played a big part in um, the history of Morrison County. During the uh, Civil War, and many of you might be familiar with the Dakota Uprising that happened in the South. And um, ironically, on the very same day that Little Crow called up his uprising in the South, Hole in the Day called an uprising of the Ojibwe in the North, in this area. They actually abducted a few missionaries. People ran to the fort. Um, people in Little Falls, they built a stockade around the courthouse and they lived there for three weeks because they were afraid for their lives. Nothing came of it. Um, there was actually uh, Father Piers was one of the men and then there was another one. His, he went by John Johnson. I can't really pronounce his Ojibwe name, but he was a missionary. They went in and they were actually able to talk whole in the day down. That's a whole other story. He was upset at Abraham Lincoln, actually. And that was why he did what he did. He felt Abraham Lincoln wasn't holding up his end of a few bargains they had made. So um, that all happened in 1862. So then after the war ended, and unfortunately James Green did not make, or not James Green, James Fergus did not make the money that he thought he would make. Um, he called Pamelia to move out to Montana with him and that's exactly what she did and that's why all of the letters are at the Montana, um, I think it's the University of Montana is where they are. Um, so they went out and they basically abandoned Little Falls. There was just a few hundred people who remained. Um, the between the war and the recession and all of these other things, it just died, basically. There was just a few hundred people here. They sent homes down the river to St. Cloud. Actually, Pamelia shared that with her husband before, um, before he called her out west. She said, I saw another house floating down the river to St. Cloud today. So um, one man who stands out amongst the others for Little Falls history is Nathan Richardson. This book is by Mary Warner, and she, um, she, at the Warehouser Museum. It's a wonderful book. I love it, actually, when I was um, in 
Height or no college, I worked at the Warehouser Museum and I was able to transcribe some of the history. And um, so that was actually the first book that has my name in it because she thanked me for that. But this book is, it's the Morrison County history but with a big emphasis on Nathan Richardson. And one of the reasons why is because during those quiet years, Nathan never gave up hope for Little Falls. And he worked tirelessly to bring um, activity back and to utilize the river and the falls and so he was able to get um, railroad here in 1872 and then in 1887 he actually him and some other men were able to attract a group of businessmen um, from the south actually who pooled their money together and they decided to build a third dam because the second dam washed away. Um, so they pulled their money together. They built the foundations of the dam they built or the foundations of the dam that is currently there. It's been updated and changed quite a bit, but that was um, done to attract industry and that's exactly what happened. Uh, we have three flour mills that came in, three brickyards, Hennepin paper mill came in in 1890. The Pine Tree Lumber Company, which was one of our biggest booms, um, they came in in 1891, and then a new and improved railroad came in, and they it went across the river over to the west side, where it currently is now, so that it could go past all of that industry, because uh, Hennepin was over there, and the Pine Tree Lumber Company uh, was where La Berge Park is right now. The Pine Tree Lumber Company um, was... Well, I'll get to that history in a little bit, but it was the largest, most uh, modern, up-to-date uh, lumber mill in the world. It was state-of-the-art. And so they drew a lot of, of people to the area. Our population boomed from 1880, was 508, to 1895, it was 5,116. Little Falls became a city in 1889 um, and became the county seat I'm not sure what year it became the county seat, but here is a picture up on the top left. They're building the footings for the dam. There's the train that came in. Um, here on the bottom left is a picture of the Pine Tree Lumber Company. And then over here is, is that new railroad. It made the west side of town grow too quite a bit. And then that was when we got a lot of our beautiful buildings, um, especially in 1891. It was a huge, huge growth. So the uh, Carnegie Library over on the right is the um, first St. Gabriel's Hospital and St. Otto's Orphanage. And then down here on the bottom right is Buckman. Um, it was originally a hotel, now it's um, senior living. And behind the Buckman Hotel was the fire station. And then, of course, our courthouse. And we, because we had those brickyards in town too, um, a lot of that is Little Falls brick. Here are a couple other beautiful buildings. Um, the two on the top are no longer in town. The one on the right was the high school, which eventually became the central office building, which is no longer there. It had a third story, as you can see, which they took off. You know, in my memory of it, it was just a two-story building with a flat roof. Um, and then over on the right is a building that not a lot of people are familiar with. That's called the Antlers Hotel. It is, or it was, right next to where Lady of Lords Church is. And it faced the river. And when it was built, it was considered the finest hotel in the Upper Northwest. And it was, I've read descriptions of it, it was lovely. Um, it attracted some people to live there. People were living there um, more permanently. Charles Lindbergh's father lived there after his first wife passed away. Charles Lindbergh's mother lived there. That's how they met. And um, the, the Warehouser, uh, Charles Warehouser and Richard Muzzer lived there as well. Then on the bottom, this is another picture from the courthouse taken about 20 years after the first one. You can see they've filled in the ravine here. This building grew a little bit. 
These buildings are currently not there. This is all that parking lot. But you can see Pine Tree Lumber Company over here. This is a corner building. It was a three-story brick building where the antique shop is, where the Northern Hotel was. Um, after all of that was gone, they built a beautiful brick building there that actually housed a college on the upper level and a pharmacy on the bottom. And there was a huge fire that actually wiped out that whole block. I don't know the years, but I remember talking to um, Gene Pappenfuss, and he was a little boy when that, when that happened, so he told us all about it. So that brings us to our pine tree bachelors. Um, Charles Warehouser on the bottom, his father, Frederick Warehouser, was uh, one of the wealthiest Americans to ever live. He's up there in the top 10. He had five sons, and he started out in Iowa um, building his, his lumber empire. But eventually, he sent his five sons out to different places in the United States, and he sent Charles to Little Falls to manage the Pine Tree Lumber Company here in Little Falls. And with him, he sent Richard Muzzer. And they always said that Richard Muzzer was the quiet, um, more analytical side of their partnership, and Charles was the personable, outgoing side. So Charles worked with the people, Richard worked with the books, and they were a great combination. Um, they first lived at the Antlers Hotel that I showed you, and then when they built their first office building, which still stands in Little Falls across from um, City Hall, they lived up there, and then eventually they decided to build the mansions, which we now have. Um, when they started building these mansions, they were both bachelors. And as you can imagine, these bachelors were very um, popular among mamas in town. And so there was, a, um, there was a lot of speculation as to who would fill these mansions that they were building. So while they were building the mansions, Charles met his wife. She actually was singing the first time he met her, and he said he fell in love with her the moment he heard her sing. So he married her, brought her home to that house when it was ready. But then um, Richard, who they called Drew, um, he um, was actually a, a bachelor for, I don't remember, I think it's eight years, but I'm not quite sure, for quite a while before he, he married. And so um, one of the reasons that I love Little Falls history, and I forgot to share this part, I actually grew up at Linden Hill. My dad was a caretaker, and we grew up in the carriage house at the bottom of the hill. And so growing up, that was my backyard. And so I, I have a lot of fond memories of um, Linden Hill. I've actually included it in a couple of books I've written. So um, between 1891 and 1920, that was the big lumber boom here in the area. And um, that was when, like I said, most of the buildings were built, most of the population grew. And then around 1920, actually 1919, that was the last of the big log drives that went down the river. And that was when Pine Tree Lumber Company decided that it was time to move west. And the Warehouser Company is still out in the Seattle area. Um, but at that time, Charles decided that he would take his family to St. Paul, and they went to Summit Avenue. But Richard Muzzer decided that he would stay in Little Falls. And they had um, Morrison County Lumber, which they sold a lot of their lumber out of. Um, but he also became a bank president. So Charles sold his home to Richard for, I believe it was a nickel and a handshake. And so between 1920, 1927, Little Falls didn't really decline because we still had the, you know, a lot of the industry was still here. But there was really no new growth. And, um, 1927 kind of changed Little Falls history. Um, I actually worked at the Lindbergh home for 10 years. I was a tour guide there and eventually was the assistant site manager. Um, so this is a story that is very dear to me. Um, I know Lindbergh is controversial, but I like to think about Lindbergh as 1927 Charles Lindbergh. And, um, what he did for Little Falls was he pretty much put us on the map. I know a lot of other people did in different ways, but he put us on the international map. Um, everybody knew where Charles Lindbergh was from. So um, in 1927, he and his family were, had not actually been living here. Um, Charles 
grew up, the first house that was on the property was a three-story home. Um, his father had been married before, and his first wife passed away. A lot of people don't know that his, um, Charles actually had two half-sisters from his father's first marriage. And so um, they were living with other family members, and then Charles's father met his mother, and she was 15 years younger than him. She was actually from Detroit, Michigan. She was a chemistry teacher, and she came to Little Falls because she thought, because of the logging, that it would be a very romantic town to live in. Well, I don't know if that met her expectation, but um, she met Charles's father. He, went, he was also a Charles, but he went by CA. They met, they married, he built her a beautiful home on the banks of the Mississippi, and they had Charles the aviator. Um, he was actually born in Detroit because his mother Evangeline went home to Detroit to deliver him and then brought him back to Little Falls. So we can't say that this is the birthplace of Charles Lindbergh. That's why a lot of people say it's the boyhood home of Charles Lindbergh. Um, so that first house actually burnt down when Charles was three. They don't know what caused the fire. Um, Charles said it was actually one of his earliest memories. And at that time, his father was running for the U.S. Senate or no, U.S. House of Representatives, excuse me. And um, so they decided that this would just become like a summer home. And so they only built a story and a half, so it's about half the size of the first house. And they called it camp, it was their summer camp. And they lived in Washington, D.C. for the winter, and then they came back here for the summer. And Charles's parents became estranged. They had a lot of problems. Um, so Charles and his mother would live at that house and his father stayed in a hotel at, in Little Falls. So he was always with his father but never really lived with his father because in Washington, D.C. they had two separate residences as well. So um, he graduated, Charles did graduate from the Little Falls High School and he went on to um, college and he did not do well so he was asked to leave. And so he decided to pursue aviation. Um, he did very well with that, as we all know. And in 1927, he was the first person to make a solo, nonstop transatlantic flight. Because there had been other transatlantic flights that were not solo or <coughs> nonstop. So um, when he came back to the United States, he actually thought that he would just fly the airplane back. And President Coolidge said, no, you won't. That's too dangerous. So they put it on um, a battleship, and they brought him back to the United States. And it is estimated that one in every four Americans went out to see Charles Lindbergh on his goodwill tour of the United States. So in August of that year, he came back to Little Falls. And um, the population at that time was around that five to 6,000. He actually there were 50,000 people in Little Falls that weekend when he came home. So he was, yeah, he brought a lot of fame to this area. His, his home um, had actually, nobody had been living in it, so souvenir hunters pretty much destroyed it. And then it was um, um, the WPA program came in and they, they fixed it up. They built the tower that's over in the park now. and. Um, then eventually in the 1960s, the Minnesota Historical Society took on the care of that, that home, and so that is who currently operates it. So that's a brief history. Last time I gave this talk, I had three hours, <laughs> so you guys got the shortened version. Uh, yes, I actually am very fascinated by Ashley Morrill. He was an Indian agent. I didn't talk a lot about it, but the, um, the hole in the day history that took place out at Crow Wing is fascinating. There was actually a town there of several hundred people, excuse me, and there was an Indian agency there, and there was a, name, a man named Lucius Walker, he was an Indian agent, and he and Hole in the Day did not see eye to eye. And so when the uprising took place, um, Lucius Walker took off. He was heading to St. Paul to warn people, but on the way he committed suicide. Nobody knows why. If he just lost it, if he got so panicked, he thought they were upon him, we don't know. Um, so at that time, right before that had happened, uh, Governor Ramsey was actually trying to get a huge 
um, area of land. Um, he was trying to write a treaty with the, the Native Americans to get that land, and that fell through because of everything that had happened. So um, Ramsey decided to put in somebody who would be easy to get along with, let's just say that. So Ashley Morrill was sent in. He became a major because um, if you're an Indian agent, you became a major, so he's Major Ashley Morrill. And he helped to, um, to get a large tract of land from the Native Americans. Um, and he built a beautiful home, you know, as a lot of those Indian agents did. And he built a home out by Little Elk, if you're familiar with the Little Elk Heritage Preserve that's out there. So it's north of town on the west side of the river. Um, it's at Ginger Grouse Road. I think it's Grouse Road that you take. And if you go out in that general area, there used to be a little town there called Little Elk. And they actually produced flour that was delivered all over the world. But um, Ashley Morrill bought that area all up and he built a beautiful home in that area. Um, there's pictures of it. I don't have any with me right now. It was just, it was stunning. It was this beautiful, beautiful Victorian, like Queen Anne Victorian mansion. And there are still four stone pillars out in that area because there was a big half circle drive and those stone pillars mark that drive. So if you ever are out in that area, you'll see these four stone pillars. That was what that was from. Um, that house actually eventually, he and his wife didn't have any children. Um, I don't know what happened after he left, but it was empty for a long time and in the 1940s it was raised. So that was one of those houses that I wish that we still had in our community. But his, his history is really interesting too. There's a lot, and I, like I said, I, I went really fast. I could talk for hours and hours. There's a lot of interesting characters um, in our history. And um, I'm always finding new things too, which is a lot of fun. I brought with a few books to show you um, where I get some of my information. The Bring Warm Clothes is one of them. These are just letters and photos and um, newspaper articles from the past. Not specifically to Morrison County, but to Minnesota, but there's several things in there. Um, Mary Warner's book is fantastic, and it includes Nathan Richardson's first original history of Morrison County. That was what I helped to transcribe. Um, this is also available out at the Weyerhaeuser Museum. And then, I didn't talk too much about the, the fur trading in the area, but um, the Red River Oxcart Trail came right through Little Falls from um, the Winnipeg area and went down to St. Paul. And so this has a lot of information um, about the Little Falls area as pertains to the Oxcart. We were on what they called the Old Woods Trail, and um, that's actually how people originally got to Little Falls. There was a stagecoach that ran weekly from St. Paul. And then one of my other, oh, I talked about the Gold Rush Widows. That's another great resource. This is another fantastic book. Um, it's purchased through the Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, they used to carry it at the Lindbergh House. I don't know if they do anymore. But it's called Old Rail Fence Corners, and it was um, around the 19-teens a group of people started realizing that the original settlers and pioneers of Minnesota were passing away. So they actually um, developed uh, an organization to go around and they had different regions and people would go and get oral histories from those pioneers and that's what this is. And so there's several in here um, about the Little Falls area, but this is just fascinating to read. I talked on it briefly, but a lot of the writing that um, I have done, I take real history and I fictionalize it just to make it a story. And um, I have one series here that was published by Harlequin, um, their Love Inspired line, which is their Christian line. So I write Christian inspirational romance. And um, this is the series that I wrote for them, one of them. That's not it. This one is, is called A Family Arrangement, and it's inspired by William Sturgis and his second wife, Rosanna, and how they ended up in Little Falls and how the town was built around them. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, 
This one um, is called Inherited Unexpected Family. I didn't title these. Um, <laughs> I, love the, I love the covers and I love the books, but the titles are not my favorite. Um, this one um, is, is set in the Northern Hotel, actually during the Little Falls War, when the lynching and, and the um, shootout and all that. And then this one is actually inspired by, <clears throat> excuse me, this one is inspired by um, the first Little Falls teacher who came to town. She was, um, she was only here for a month before she got married and they couldn't keep women here because there was actually over 300 eligible bachelors in town. And so um, there's a mix up that takes place where they think they're getting a man and she comes instead. So it's kind of fun. Um, this book right here, where is it? This one was actually the story that I have in this one is inspired by um, a real uh, advertisement that the men in Little Falls put out in 1857. It basically said wanted um, brides because there was 300 eligible bachelors for any woman who would come to Little Falls. And so I decided who would be desperate enough to answer that ad and I put her in this book. This one was my very first book with um, Harlequin, and it um, is actually set in 1918 during the influenza pandemic that wiped across the country. And it's um, inspired actually by a picture that I have of a father and his four little kids. Um, it's a picture taken in Little Falls around that same time period, and his wife is actually in the coffin in the front. It's a jarring picture actually when you see it, but I, um, I wondered who came in and filled his wife's shoes. And so that was kind of what inspired this story. And then the other books that I have, this one here is a story inspired um, by the fur trade. And it's set in, I believe, 1792 in central Minnesota. And then my other ones are not set in Minnesota. This one is set in Texas. This one is set in England. And then this one is also set in Texas. But it's a whole different topic. So I actually, um, right now, I'm contracted to write a new series of books for Harlequin. But they will be contemporary novels. And so I've set them here in Little Falls, um, changed the name to Timber Falls, changed everybody else's name. So if people ask me, do you ever put real people in your novels? I said, well, of course I do. You know, people I know kind of, sh kind of shape and form my characters. I don't actually do it intentionally, but usually by the time I get done writing a character, I'm like, oh, that's my husband, or oh, that's my daughter. Well, I love talking to you guys. Like I said, I could talk about this all day. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you.